Chapter 6 Look, you two, Winston Egbert said dramatically, stepping up to the crowded table where Jessica and Amy were firing questions at each other from the Guinness Book of World Records. If you really have any hope of winning on Tuesday afternoon, you're going to need coaching from the King of Trivia. It was Friday at lunchtime, and Jessica and Amy were both in high spirits, especially Jessica, who was looking forward to her date with David Campbell that evening. A crowd had gathered around them, and both girls were enjoying the attention their practice was getting. Until Winston arrived, that is. Jessica did not find the tall, gangly junior half as amusing as some of her classmates seemed to. And just then, she thought he was a royal pain. Come on, Winston, she scoffed. What do you know about trivia? Winston clutched his heart, pretending to swoon with pain. She's hurting my pride, he cried. Ken Matthews and Bill Chase burst out laughing. I'm serious, Winston said. Look, guys, you know what a trivia god I am. You tell her what she's done to me, pretending to forget my heroic feats. Winston, you're weird, Amy Sutton said, giggling. For example, Winston went on, clearing his throat and taking a chair near Jessica and Amy. What was the name of the ship Charles Darwin sailed on during his most famous voyage? Jessica and Amy exchanged stricken glances. Charles Darwin? Jessica repeated incredulously. Something every trivia fiend should know, Winston said reprovingly. Amy looked upset. What was it called? She asked Jessica. Jessica gave Winston a dirty look. Ask something else, she instructed him. No one's going to ask us about Charles Darwin. Okay, Winston scratched his head, thinking hard. But for your information, it was called the Beagle. He thought for a minute. What are the first two letters on every boat registration in the state of California? They're not going to ask us that, Jessica shrieked. Amy looked confused. What if they do, she demanded. What are they, Winston? CF, Winston said with evident satisfaction. Girls, you too need a little work, he added pretending to ignore the scattered applause that broke out around the table when he answered his own question. I'd be willing to coach you, for a small fee, of course, but we're going to have to get started right away if your big day is Tuesday. Jessica's eyes darkened. I'm sure we're going to do just fine, she said loftily. Don't worry, she added reassuringly, patting Amy's arm. I promise we're going to do incredibly well. And even if we don't, after tonight, I'm sure I'll be able to convince David to make sure we win, she thought. Jessica was positive David would throw the contest once he and Jessica had really started going out. So far, they'd only had two casual dates. But once things got romantic, she was sure he'd be as eager for Jessica and Amy to win as the girls were themselves. Not that Jessica was interested in David only for that reason. Far from it. In fact, Jessica had butterflies in her stomach just thinking about David Campbell. She hadn't been this interested in a guy in a long time. But it had struck her that if she could make David fall madly in love with her, one dividend would be that David would never allow himself to let her lose. And what could be better than being allowed to win a big trivia show by your brand new boyfriend? Hey, Jessica, come down off your cloud and talk to us earth people, Winston joked, snapping his fingers under her nose. Jessica started and then gave him a dirty look. But she knew Winston was right. This wasn't the time or place to daydream about David Campbell. That, she thought, smiling, would have to wait until later. Elizabeth hummed to herself as she climbed the stairs to her bedroom. Friday afternoon, just a week until winter carnival. It was incredible how quickly her spirits had been lifted, which made her realize that it really was Jessica who had been upsetting her. Now that they had talked, Elizabeth was feeling much more like her old self. She couldn't believe she had been so critical of Jessica. After all, what had Jessica really done wrong? Borrow a sweater without asking? Shirk dinner duty a few times? 
Elizabeth smiled as she threw her books down on the chair in the corner of her bedroom. It was Friday, and she was in good mood, with the whole weekend to look forward to. And she was inclined to forgive her sister for everything, now that they were back on their usual good terms. Elizabeth glanced at her watch, then walked into the bathroom that joined the twins' rooms. She knocked loudly on Jessica's door. Come in, her sister yelled over the sound of her stereo, which was turned to top volume. Elizabeth opened the door gingerly, her eyes widening at the sight that greeted her. Jessica was ransacking her dresser, tearing clothes out with terrifying speed, scrutinizing each garment, and then either balling it up and stuffing it back into the dresser or tossing it helter-skelter onto the bed. What's happening in here? I'm trying to find something to wear tonight, Jessica muttered. This is too bright, too small, too funky, she kept saying feverishly. Oh, Liz, what am I going to do? She cried at last, stricken. I want to look really great tonight. Elizabeth regarded the pile of clothes on the bed. If you can't find something in that mountain of stuff, I don't know where else you'll find anything. See, I want to have just the right look. Jessica confided, shaking out her wrinkled silk tunic. Where did this come from? She mumbled, more to herself than to her sister. David's very particular about the way women dress, I think. His mother owns a boutique in the mall. You know that little one with the really expensive clothes we never go into? It's called Beebe's? Oh, yeah, the one with all those strange mannequins in the window. Jessica nodded. I think she's really high fashion. And David's sister Barbara is meeting us somewhere tonight with Mitch, her boyfriend. And David makes her sound like the most glamorous thing ever. She threw the tunic down. I don't have a thing to wear, she declared miserably. Elizabeth laughed. Well, you're welcome to anything of mine, she said generously. I won't be needing anything special to wear tonight. In fact, that's what I came in here for, Jess. I need to ask you a big favor. Sure, Jessica murmured, turning back to her dresser drawer. I'm supposed to babysit for Teddy Collins tonight, Elizabeth said, sitting gingerly on the edge of Jessica's bed in an effort not to crumple any of the clothes thrown all over it. Teddy was Mr. Collins' six-year-old son. After his divorce, Mr. Collins had won custody of the adorable little boy. Actually, I'm not really babysitting, she corrected herself, watching Jessica's whirlwind activity with amusement. Mr. Collins is away for the weekend, so Heather's staying over both nights. Heather was Mr. Collins' sister, who lived nearby and had agreed to stay with Teddy. Jessica looked as if she wasn't following very closely. Uh-huh, she murmured, seizing a black oversized vest and examining it closely. But Heather doesn't drive... Elizabeth pointed out. That's where I come in. Apparently, Teddy's gone to a birthday party at Ricky Alden's, and he needs a ride home. I'm supposed to pick him up when the party's over and take him back to Mr. Collins's. Jessica made a little noise, apparently meant to show she was still listening. Liz, what do you think of this? She demanded, holding the vest up in front of her. It's nice, Elizabeth said. Jess, are you listening to any of this? I need to ask you a big favor. She checked her watch again. Mr. Alden is going to call sometime after six to let me know what time he, to pick Teddy up and to leave directions to his house. But I promised Jeffrey I'd play tennis with him this afternoon, and I don't think I'll be back before 6.30. And Mom and Dad are going out to dinner straight from work. Could you just take the message for me and let Mr. Alden know I'll definitely be there to get Teddy? Sure, Jessica said, putting on a bright pink long sleeve shirt. Where are you guys playing tennis? The grass courts at the park, Elizabeth said, jumping up off the bed. So you promise you'll get all that done? The time I should get him and the directions? I promise, Jessica laughed. Don't be such a worry wart, she added. David isn't picking me up until seven. I promise, she added, giggling at the concerned look on her sister's face. She slipped the vest over her shirt. Elizabeth looked at her dubiously. I don't know about that vest, Jess. Don't you think it's kind of, I don't know, kind of big? Jessica inspected herself in the full-length mirror on the back of the bedroom door. Big as in, she replied, pivoting a little in front of the glass. 
The vest hung down loosely over the tight black stirrup pants Jessica was wearing. This is perfect, Jessica declared admiringly. Even David's sister won't be able to object. Elizabeth laughed. Well, whatever you decide to wear, don't forget the message, she repeated, stepping out into the hall. Jessica gave her a doleful look. You don't trust me, she said mournfully. You don't even think I can handle a simple set of directions. Elizabeth felt herself relenting. All right, all right, she said. She didn't have time to stick around berating her sister anyway. She had to meet Jeffrey in less than half an hour. And she couldn't even remember where she'd left her tennis racket. Besides, even Jessica could handle this, she assured herself. What on earth could possibly go wrong? Perfect, Jessica declared, studying herself in the mirror. It had taken ages, but she was finally convinced she looked good, even good enough for David Campbell. Now all she had to do was wait for Seven to row around. To her surprise, she heard a car pull into the drive. It was only 6.15. Maybe it was Elizabeth coming back early, Jessica thought. She gave her hair a few furious last-minute strokes with her brush and was just applying her lip gloss when the doorbell rang. It couldn't be Elizabeth then. Jessica frowned, peering out the window down at the drive below. It was David's blue MG. What's he doing here this early, she asked herself. She grabbed frantically at her purse and instantly decided she hated what she was wearing. I'm sorry I'm so early, David said apologetically when she opened the front door a few moments later. He took his sunglasses off and smiled at her. Barbara and Mitch called a little while ago, and they want us to meet them at seven at a Japanese restaurant that's about half an hour away, so I thought we'd better get an early start. Jessica was so busy thinking how wonderful David looked that she barely noticed what he'd said, or registered the fact that they were going out for Japanese food, what she had never tried, and had never wanted to try very much either. David looked great. He was wearing loose, well-worn chinos that were faded just the right amount. He had a great tan, and he was making the most of it with a pale yellow shirt and a white sweater that was knotted around his neck. He had just the sort of looks Jessica loved, dark, handsome, and ultra cool. Uh-oh, Jessica said suddenly, hearing the telephone ring. Hang on a second, David. I have to grab the phone. The next minute, she was listening to Mr. Alden explain that the birthday party would be breaking up around 6.30. Jessica explained that her sister wouldn't be coming home until then, but that she'd leave her a message with the time and the directions. Don't worry about Teddy, she told him, impressed with her own efficiency. Liz will be there as soon as she can. Jessica took down the directions he gave her on a slip of paper from her father's desk, and after she had hung up, she checked them twice to make sure they were legible. What a good sister I am, she thought with a little smile. There was no way she was going to let Elizabeth down again. Jess, we should probably get going if we're going to make it by seven, David called from the front hall. Suddenly, Jessica had a million things to do. She had to lock both doors, find her makeup kit, turn off all the lights, comb her hair again, and run back upstairs to get some money. In all the excitement, she had absolutely no idea that she had taken the note for Elizabeth and slipped it in her purse. Got everything? David asked, smiling down at her as he opened the front door. Yep, Jessica exclaimed. As she followed him out to his car, she could hardly wait for the evening to get started. Chapter 7 An hour later, Jessica was snuggled next to David in a dimly lit booth in a taste of Tokyo. Barbara and Mitch were across from them, masterfully eating pieces of sashimi with their chopsticks. Why aren't you eating anything, Jessica? Barbara asked, giving Jessica a slightly critical look. Jessica swallowed. The thought of raw fish just didn't appeal to her, but she didn't want to be a bad sport. Barbara and Mitch were eating the tiny morsels with evident enjoyment. But then Barbara and Mitch were different. Barbara was 19, but she acted as if she were about 29. She treated David and Jessica like two-year-olds. Mitch was even worse. He kept talking about Hollywood and going into film, and he was wearing the weirdest clothes. An oversized Hawaiian shirt fastened at the throat with a jeweled pin and strangely cut linen pants that made him look emaciated. 
His glasses were Kelly cream, and when Jessica made a remark about them, Mitch gave her a scornful look. I have 25 pairs of glasses, he told her. I change them to go with what I'm wearing. Jessica couldn't help wondering about Mitch and Barbara. Fortunately, David didn't seem to take after his older sister at all. He was evidently enjoying her company, but was focusing most of his energy and attention on Jessica. He seemed proud to be her date, which delighted Jessica. It was worth putting up with a slightly eccentric older sister and a platter of raw fish for a chance to get to know David better. You really ought to try this sashimi, Jess, Barbara said reprovingly, picking up an ivory-colored piece of raw fish with her chopsticks. It's delicious. Jessica picked up her chopsticks and gave Barbara a cooperative smile. She didn't think it was a good idea to antagonize her in case Barbara had any influence on David. I'd love to try some, she lied, reaching for the closest piece. It didn't look much like fish, but then none of this stuff looked the way it ought to. It was a green, pasty ball, and Jessica had a problem picking it up with her chopsticks. Barbara was too busy feeding a silvery piece of fish to Mitch to notice that Jessica had taken the fiery hot horseradish by mistake, and David didn't notice till Jessica had already popped it into her mouth. Oh no, he exclaimed quickly pouring her a glass of water. Drink some of this, he commanded, holding it up to her mouth. Jessica felt as if her mouth were in flames. Sputtering and coughing, her face about as red as the tablecloth, she reached for the glass. It was several minutes before she could thank him. Barbara and Mitch were looking on with a mixture of concern and amusement, which didn't make her feel much better. So much for sashimi, she thought furiously, digging through her bag to find a tissue. Oh, no, she gasped, pulling out the note with the directions to Mr. Alden's house scrawled on it. She forgot all about the burning horseradish she had just swallowed. All she could think about was Elizabeth, waiting anxiously for Mr. Alden's call and not knowing what to do. Will you excuse me? I have to make a phone call, she said hastily, sliding out of the booth with a note in her hand. She noticed that Barbara was giving her a strange look, but Jessica didn't care. She couldn't believe she had been so careless. Elizabeth was going to kill her, and after she'd sworn to be more responsible about everything, too. It took several minutes for Jessica to find the payphone and get change for a dollar. Then someone else was using the phone, and she had to wait. Finally, she dialed the Wakefield's number. The phone rang 12 times before she hung up, frustrated and upset. Where was Elizabeth? Had she managed to get through to Mr. Alden even without the note? Jessica could see David laughing with his sister and Mitch as she approached the table, and she decided then and there to put Elizabeth out of her mind for the time being. It wasn't as though there was anything she could do about it now, anyway. Besides, Jessica knew she'd be able to explain to Elizabeth when she got home. It was an accident, she rationalized, and accidents could happen to anybody. I had a really nice time tonight, Jessica said huskily. She and David were parked in front of the Wakefield's house. It was late, and the only light was coming from Elizabeth's room upstairs. I had a nice time too, David said, putting his arm behind her along the car seat. I'm sorry if my sister was kind of weird. She's a nice girl, but she can act pretty affected at times. I thought she was really nice, Jessica lied. She leaned back a little so that David's arm was touching her shoulders. I bet you and Jake have really been working hard, reviewing your trivia for Tuesday, she said casually. David's eyes crinkled up at the corners. Hey, let's not mix business and pleasure, he said, letting his hand drop to her shoulder and pulling her closer to him. Jessica glanced quickly at him. That didn't sound quite as promising as she had hoped. You know, winning the contest on Tuesday would mean an awful lot to my partner, Amy, she said softly, brushing his fingers with her own. I don't really care that much about things like that, but Amy has her heart set on winning. It would just be such a shame for her if we didn't win, she added, looking up at David from lowered lashes. She tried to look helpless and sweet, but David didn't seem to be cooperative. In fact, he was grinning at her. Tonight is Friday, he said, putting his hands on her shoulders and looking down deep into her eyes. And as far as I'm concerned, tonight I give in to anything you ask, Jessica. 
but Tuesday is Tuesday, and I'm afraid I'm just no good at trying to lose. So I guess it'll just have to be every person for himself. Jessica could feel herself pouting a little. That's not very nice, she said, pulling back from him, a hurt expression in her eyes. David burst out laughing. You don't really expect me to let you win on Tuesday, do you? Jessica glared at him. She didn't know what she expected, but after putting up with his sister and practically killing herself on a lump of horseradish, she thought she deserved more consideration than this. I have to go in now, she said, opening the car door on her side. David put his hand on hers. Wait, Jess, I really had fun tonight. Don't be mad at me. Jessica pulled away from him. I've got to go study some more trivia, she told him. There's no way I'm going to let you win on Tuesday. Good. I like a girl who's competitive, David chuckled. But I better warn you, Jake and I are really hot. We're going to be pretty tough to beat. Jessica got out of the car. Thanks for everything, she said angrily, slamming the car door shut and hurrying into the house. She couldn't believe what a jerk he had turned out to be. Any decent guy would have promised not to win, or at least to try not to make the competition too difficult. But David Campbell obviously wasn't a decent guy. He was a jerk, she told herself, digging in her bag for her house keys. A complete and total jerk. Still, she couldn't help noticing that he didn't start his car until she was safely inside. A jerk, but a considerate jerk, she thought. All in all, it looked as though Tuesday was going to be pretty interesting. Liz, Jessica said softly, knocking on her sister's door. She didn't hear anything at first and knocked again. Come in, Elizabeth said. She didn't sound friendly, but Jessica was so busy thinking about David that she barely noticed. Hey, I'm so sorry about messing up Mr. Alden's message, Jessica said, hurrying in and plopping down on the end of her sister's bed. Elizabeth was reading in bed, but she set her novel down when Jessica came in. Her face was stony. I hope I didn't mess everything up, Jessica said, leaning over to examine a small scuff mark on her black flats. Liz, I'm so glad you're still up. I have to tell you what just happened with David. Elizabeth cleared her throat angrily. Jessica, she said coldly, do you have any idea what an idiot I look like tonight? Jessica regarded her sister. What do you mean? What I mean, Elizabeth said sternly, is that when I got back from playing tennis, there was no message. Nothing. So I hung around, assuming that Mr. Alden just hadn't called before you left. Finally, I decided to go ahead and call him, just to make sure there hadn't been any confusion. And guess what? What? Jessica repeated, her expression innocent. He wasn't there, Elizabeth snapped. You know where he was? How would I know where he was? Jessica asked, injured. He was driving Teddy back to Mr. Collins's house because he'd left a message here and I never came. Can you imagine how intelligent I felt when I finally got through to him and found out what had happened? Jessica found a piece of gum in her purse and unwrapped it slowly. Well, it doesn't sound that bad, she said at last, popping the gum into her mouth. I mean, at least Teddy got home safely. It could have been worse. Jessica, Elizabeth said angrily, the point is that I look totally irresponsible. I promised Mr. Collins I'd pick Teddy up, and I didn't come through. Instead, Mr. Alden had to take him home. And you know whose fault it was that I looked so irresponsible? I guess it was mine, Jessica said, chewing. She thought Elizabeth was making too big a deal out of the whole thing. Mr. Collins was hardly going to care who had driven little Teddy home from Ricky Alden's birthday party. Listen, Liz, I'm sorry. I really am. I was just totally flustered, and somehow I threw the message in my purse. She shook her head, remembering. You wouldn't blame me if you had any idea how traumatic everything was. David was almost an hour early, and I don't think you understand, Elizabeth interrupted, her eyes blazing. Jess, the point is that I asked you for a favor, and you promised. How could you just accidentally take the message with you? Don't you realize how worried I was? How stupid I felt? Jessica stared at her twin. Look, I said I was sorry. I have no idea how I managed to mess up, but I tried calling you, and you weren't home. I went over to Mr. Alden's to apologize. Oh, good. Then it's okay. All okay, Jessica said, said, brightening. You can't be mad at me, Liz. I have to ask your advice about David. 
Well, I am mad at you, Elizabeth retorted, grabbing her novel and flipping the pages furiously. And I don't want to hear about David, she added, glaring at Jessica. I think you need to think about what a promise means, Jessica Wakefield. And I think it's high time you started taking your responsibilities a little more seriously. Jessica got up and picked up her purse. Well, I guess I'd better go study some trivia, she said, hoping Elizabeth could be sidetracked into a new topic of conversation, one that could lead to David and Tuesday. Elizabeth just ignored her and pretended to read her novel. Jessica was forced to leave without asking her sister's advice about her date. Jessica frowned as she walked to her bedroom. She couldn't believe Elizabeth was so mad about one silly little message. Something else must be bothering her, Jessica decided, and it was up to her to find out what it was. Chapter 8 Jessica was lying flat on her back on the diving board of the Wakefield's pool, thinking how wonderful Saturdays were. What a perfect afternoon. She had the whole house to herself, too. Elizabeth had gone off to spend the day with Jeffrey, and both Mr. and Mrs. Wakefield were catching up on work downtown. It was one of those Southern California winter days that might have been the middle of summer, and Jessica was taking advantage of it, basking in the sun so her tan would be perfect for the following weekend. She was thinking about a dozen different things, the likelihood of being asked science questions on Tuesday, whether or not she should get her hair cut before the carnival, why Elizabeth was still being so grumpy, and what to do about it. That she was supposed to meet Elizabeth and Jeffrey at the Dairy Burger at five with a bunch of other people. She squinted up at the sun, making sure she was still in the best position for maximum tanning, then stretched languidly, closed her eyes, and went back to her jumbled thoughts. Too bad David had been so wretched the night before, she thought, or something wonderful might have come of their friendship. He was out in the cold now. There was no way she was going to give him the pleasure of dating her, not after his behavior about the trivia contest. Suddenly, Jessica's eyes flew open. The phone was ringing inside. Grabbing her towel, she hurried across the patio and opened the sliding door, reaching the telephone in the study on the fifth ring. Liz, a familiar voice asked. Jessica's brow wrinkled. Todd Wilkins, she exclaimed. It isn't Liz, it's Jessica, she added hastily, plopping down on a chair and tucking her legs underneath her. I haven't heard your voice in ages. How are you? She asked. She couldn't believe her luck. Here she had been hoping for a chance to get to the bottom of Elizabeth's bad mood, and now she had a likely suspect right on the line. Jessica had her doubts about Elizabeth and Todd's breakup. She knew Todd had supposedly fallen in love with Suzanne Devlin and that Elizabeth insisted their friendship had cooled off due to separation. But Jessica couldn't give up the idea that they were still attached to each other. She had been wondering if Elizabeth's current bad mood might have something to do with Todd's imminent visit. After all, that would make sense. Here Elizabeth had convinced herself that she and Todd were just friends. But now that Todd was planning to come to Sweet Valley for Winter Carnival, it was only natural for her real feelings to resurface. Or so Jessica speculated as she listened to Todd telling her how cold it was in Vermont and how much he was looking forward to his visit in Sweet Valley. I know Liz is going to be so upset she missed you, Jessica said coyly, twisting the telephone cord around her one finger. She didn't see much point in telling the poor boy that her sister was out with Jeffrey. Why make him feel bad, she thought. Can I give her a message, she asked trying to make her voice inviting enough so that Todd could break down and confess how much he still loved Elizabeth. All Todd said, though, was that the dinner for Friday night was still on. I know Liz was planning on going up to the carnival on Friday afternoon, but the PTA awards banquet is that night. Tell Liz I'll completely understand if she can't make the dinner, okay? Just ask her to call me when she gets a chance to let me know. I promise I'll tell her, Jessica said, writing the message out with special care. After the previous evening, she wasn't going to risk getting another message wrong. Anything else? She asked meaningfully. No, that's it, Todd replied, except that I'm looking forward to seeing you both. Jessica raised her eyebrows. She was sure he was. It was really kind of heartbreaking. 
but she knew she shouldn't interfere. She wasn't going to risk meddling, and not at this point, with Elizabeth getting angry at the slightest provocation. No, she was simply going to give her sister the phone message, word for word. Jessica was going to do everything right from now on. She had too much to worry about without having to be anxious about Elizabeth's being angry. With a wave of self-righteousness, Jessica folded the piece of paper with the message on it into a neat square and left it on the desk, where she'd be sure to remember it. She was going to get this message to her sister if it killed her. Elizabeth scooped up a spoonful of vanilla ice cream from the root beer float she was drinking and listened with contentment to the chatter around her. The group had settled at one of the big round tables in the back of the Dairy Burger, one of the most popular places in town. A jukebox with a selection of current hits was part of its appeal, as well as a big game room with the latest video games and two dilapidated pinball machines. It was a perfect place to meet after a day at the beach, and as Elizabeth smiled around the table at the group of classmates she and Jeffrey had joined, she could feel herself relaxing. She had woken up that morning still angry with Jessica. Her sister's cavalier attitude toward the mishap the night before was what had irritated her the most. Okay, so Jessica had made a mistake. That seemed fair enough, though it was hardly an isolated occurrence. The least Jessica could have done was to take the mistake seriously, Elizabeth thought. Instead, she had brushed it off, acting surprised that Elizabeth even cared. But Elizabeth had decided by mid-morning to try her hardest to forget Jessica and enjoy her day with Jeffrey instead. She couldn't help feeling that things had been slightly strained between them since the night she had been forced to cancel their date at Tiberina's. Also, one or both of them had been so busy lately. They had had fun playing tennis the day before, but it hadn't been very personal. They hadn't had a close talk in ages. But today, today had been absolutely perfect, Elizabeth thought happily, taking a sip of root beer. They had found a deserted little cove miles down the public beach and had spread out their towels, lying down and holding hands as the sun beat down and the waves crashed in. She blushed a little, remembering some of the affectionate things Geoffrey had said. Her reverie was interrupted by Winston Egbert, who was being his usual boisterous self. A straw wrapper whizzed past her. Warning, warning, twin approaching, Winston shrieked, pretending to duck. Elizabeth laughed. Sure enough, Jessica was hurrying toward the crowded table. Sorry I'm late, everyone, Jessica exclaimed, taking the chair next to Jeffrey that they'd been saving for her. We've been frantic, Winston said with mock concern. We thought she'd been abducted, or drawn and quartered, or at least triviaed out. Jessica rolled her eyes at him. Thanks for your concern, Winston, she said wryly. Everyone laughed at this exchange, and Jessica fished around in her handbag, leaning past Jeffrey to pass Elizabeth the folded piece of paper. What's this? Elizabeth asked, surprised. Todd called, Jessica said. You know, he wanted to talk about Friday night. To her dismay, Elizabeth felt herself turning red. Jeffrey was looking at her quizzically, and she glanced away, a funny feeling in her stomach. The truth was that she still hadn't gotten around to talking to Jeffrey about Todd and the awards banquet. Leave it to Jessica, she thought. At least everybody else at the table was busy talking. No one seemed to have heard what Jessica said. No one, that is, but Jeffrey. Don't you want to know what he said? Jessica demanded. Elizabeth was still beat red. What did he say? She managed, trying to sound natural. Jeffrey was staring at her, and she felt terribly uncomfortable. Just that the dinner is still on for Friday, and you should call him and let him know if you can still go. Thanks, Elizabeth said, toying with her spoon. I'll explain in a minute, she murmured to Jeffrey. Jeffrey was avoiding her gaze. That's all right, he muttered. Will you excuse me, he said, pushing his chair back and getting to his feet. I've got to take off. I just remembered I promised my mom I'd have the car back by six. Elizabeth barely noticed the surprise objections everyone raised. She got up, too, determined to go with him. She knew Jeffrey wouldn't make a scene by telling her not to come with him. Hastily putting some money on the table to cover their part of the bill, she hurried after him. What was that all about, she demanded. Were you really planning on just storming out on me? 
Jeffrey's face was pale and his mouth tight with anger. What's the deal, Liz? First you tell me Todd is coming in for the carnival. Then I find out by accident that you've got some kind of date lined up with him for Friday. What about our date? Weren't we supposed to go to the opening party together? They had crossed to the door now, and Elizabeth hurried after Jeffrey as he headed to his car. I can't believe you, she exclaimed. Aren't you even going to give me a chance to explain? You don't have to explain. Your face gave the whole thing away, he said bitterly, jerking the car door open and getting in the driver's seat. Jeffrey, Elizabeth exclaimed. For heaven's sake, will you let me? She broke off, hurrying around to the passenger side and getting in the car. She didn't want to risk his driving off before she could explain what had happened, and he seemed almost angry enough to do just that. Go on then, tell me what's up, he challenged. Elizabeth bit her lip. It really isn't a very big deal, she said slowly. I'm just surprised by the way you're acting. You know Todd and I are friends. Why are you acting so jealous? Maybe I am jealous, Jeffrey said. Come on, Liz, look at it from my point of view. Everyone always talks about what a great thing you and Todd had together. You two went out for ages. Can't you see why that would make me feel uncomfortable? Of course I feel insecure. I was worried about his being around for the carnival as it was. And then your sister starts saying things about Friday night like... He broke off, looking really upset. Jeffrey, listen, Elizabeth exclaimed. I didn't tell you earlier because I was hoping the awards dinner would be changed to another night. And I really would prefer to go with you to the opening party. She explained about the awards dinner and Jeffrey's expression softened. Anyway, it's hardly a big deal. Todd wants me to go because I know Timothy, the boy who's getting the scholarship. It's honestly not anything to be jealous of, Jeffrey, an awards banquet sponsored by the PTA. Jeffrey looked sheepish. Well, maybe I jumped to conclusions, he admitted, but why didn't you mention it to me earlier? He asked. That's what bothers me, Liz. It makes it seem like you had something to hide. Elizabeth frowned. I told you, I didn't want to get you upset before I knew for sure that the banquet was definitely going to be held on Friday. Jeffrey turned the key in the ignition. Well, I don't know if I'd buy that, he muttered. You could have mentioned it to me anyway. This way it all seems kind of sneaky and underhanded, Liz. How would you feel if the tables were turned? Elizabeth just stared at him. She honestly hadn't expected him to be this upset. In fact, it bothered her a great deal to hear him talking this way. Maybe she should have mentioned the potential conflict earlier, but that was hardly an excuse for his behavior. Didn't she have a right to spend an evening with an old friend? Jeffrey could hardly expect her not to see Todd at all when he was back, could he? It seemed to Elizabeth that Jeffrey was being unreasonable. It might have been flattering if he had been a tiny bit jealous, but this? This seemed ridiculous. He was acting as if he owned her, as if the entire world were going to collapse if she spent a minute alone with Todd. Elizabeth felt confused and upset. She hardly knew what to say, and apparently Jeffrey didn't either. They rode the rest of the way back to the Wakefield's house in silence, and after a terse goodbye, Elizabeth got out of the car, half expecting him to stop her before she reached the front walk. But he didn't stop her. In fact, he pulled away at once and Elizabeth felt a sinking sensation in the pit of her stomach as she watched his car disappear. Their wonderful day had turned into a disaster. Now what was she going to do? Chapter 9 The phone ringing woke Elizabeth up Sunday morning. She started to reach for it, but it stopped. She looked at her clock and saw that it was almost time to get up. As she lay there, she thought about the evening before. It didn't seem possible it had really happened. Sitting up in bed, she stared unhappily at the sunlight streaming in through her open window. Everything rushed back to her, and her eyes filled with tears. How could Jeffrey have acted the way he had? Didn't he trust her at all? Maybe she should have mentioned the dinner with Todd as soon as it came up, but it was hardly as though she'd been scheming. She cared a great deal for Todd, but they were friends now, nothing more. Sighing, Elizabeth swung her legs over the side of her bed and got up. She headed mechanically over to her dresser and picked up her hairbrush, frowning at her reflection. She wasn't sure what she ought to do. It didn't seem to be up to her to call and apologize, but from the angry expression on Jeffrey's face the night before, it was unlikely that he would be the first to call. 
They had planned to spend the afternoon together with a big group at a picnic at Seca Lake, but Elizabeth wasn't certain now that he would show up. Feeling terrible, she set her hairbrush down. Liz, can I come in? Jessica called, flying in before Elizabeth could respond. It's gorgeous out, Jessica declared, twisting her hair up into a high ponytail as she spoke and twirling around in a little half circle. What a great day for a picnic! Liz, do you realize this is your lucky day? David just called and he says he's going to meet us all at the lake. I thought you hated David, Elizabeth said absently. I don't really hate him, Jessica admitted, tilting her head to one side as she considered the matter. I think he's a jerk for taking the trivia bowl so seriously, but he is kind of cute. Besides, Amy and I talked it over last night, and we're sure the two of us can go to work on him and get him to change his mind. Elizabeth pulled open a dresser drawer and frowned at its contents. She really wasn't in a very good mood for a picnic. What if Jeffrey just didn't come at all? What if he never spoke to her again? Hey, what's wrong? Jessica asked. You seem really upset. Elizabeth looked long and hard at her sister. Why not ask Jessica's advice? This time, it really wasn't Jessica's fault that things had gone awry. Jessica had done only what Elizabeth had made her promise to do. Take a careful phone message and deliver it promptly. Maybe she hadn't shown the greatest tact in announcing it in front of Jeffrey, but then Jessica had no way of knowing that Elizabeth hadn't told him about the awards banquet. It's to Jeffrey, she said helplessly. Jess, he's really mad at me because of Todd. Taking a deep breath, she proceeded to fill her sister in on everything that had happened the night before. Jessica listened thoughtfully. Hmm, she said at last, plopping down in the chair to think it over. Has Jeffrey ever acted possessive of you before? Elizabeth shook her head unhappily. Never. Of course, I haven't really given him any reason to before. Not that I have now, she added hastily, but you know what I mean. Of course, Jessica said reassuringly. You know, I don't think this is such a big deal, she added. I mean, my experience has always been that it doesn't hurt to make a guy a little jealous. Now that you and Jeffrey have been going out pretty seriously for a while, you're just at the stage when things are in danger of getting boring. Maybe Jeffrey needs something like this to keep him from taking me for granted. Elizabeth thought this over. But he's never taken me for granted, she objected. Well, he may have been on the verge of it before this thing with Todd came up, Jessica's eyes sparkled. I think you're lucky, Liz. With Todd coming, you can make sure Jeffrey realizes how special you are. I wouldn't take it too far or anything, but a few moments of insecurity never did anyone any harm. Elizabeth looked wonderingly at her. So what do you think I should do? I wouldn't do anything. Are you going to see Jeffrey today? I was supposed to. We were going to meet up at Seca Lake with everyone else, but I was thinking I should call him to make sure he's still planning on coming. The way we left things last night, Elizabeth's voice trailed off. Don't call him, Jessica advised. Just go to the picnic and act perfectly normal. Let him do the apologizing. Remember what that dating book said, the one mom gave us years ago that we used to crack up over? It never hurts to let a boy worry a little. Not bad advice, really. Elizabeth smiled. She remembered the book. She, Amy, and Jessica used to laugh themselves sick over it. Well, maybe you're right, she mused. Jeffrey really was being kind of unfair about the whole thing. Of course he was. It's because he's just realizing how madly in love with you he is. I'm telling you, Liz, with a little careful planning, you'll have him wrapped around your little finger. I can just see the two of you at the snowball, she added rapturously. You and Jeffrey will be dancing together, and suddenly he'll see Todd coming toward you. He'll get all protective of you. He'll hold you really close and start telling you how much he loves you. Poor T- Todd will be stricken, she added gleefully. It'll be fantastic. Elizabeth laughed out loud. I don't know, Jess. I don't think I could really enjoy having two guys fighting over me. Jessica shook her head impatiently. You just don't give yourself enough credit, she protested. Trust me, Liz, don't try too hard to put Jeffrey's mind at ease. A little dose of jealousy is just what he needs. Follow my advice and you'll be the hit of the snowball. I promise. Elizabeth grinned. Well, it's worth a try. Anyway, it sounds like all you're advising me to do is play it cool for the next few days. And that can't possibly get me into trouble. 
That's the spirit, Jessica said warmly. Come on, we've got to get ready for the picnic, she added. Jessica had been looking forward to the afternoon anyway, but now that she had the prospect of watching Elizabeth and Jeffrey in action, she could hardly wait for the picnic to get started. By three o'clock, the picnic was in full swing. About 25 juniors had gathered by the lake, and bright blankets had been spread out and heaped with sandwiches and cold drinks. Kim Matthews and Bill Chase had both brought tape decks, and the air was filled with music. Jessica was trying to organize frisbee softball in the flat meadow near the lake, and Elizabeth and Enid were watching with amusement from the sidelines as Caroline Pierce went to bat with the fluorescent disc. Where's Jeffrey? Enid asked her friend. I thought you two were coming together. Elizabeth pretended to be deeply absorbed in the ice cream sandwich she was unwrapping. I guess he's coming later. I don't know, she said in an offhand voice. Enid's green eyes widened. Uh-oh, did something happen that I don't know about? Elizabeth shrugged. Not really, except Jeffrey turns out to have a real jealous streak. She filled her friend in on the events of the day before, and Enid listened with concern. I don't know if I agree with Jessica's advice, she said finally. Jeffrey really strikes me as sensitive. Don't you think it would be better to tell him how you feel, to make sure he understands that it's all over between you and Todd? Elizabeth flushed. Secretly, she had wondered the same thing herself when Jessica was talking to her that morning, but now she felt defensive about her strategy. He ought to know that. I've made it pretty clear, she objected. Speaking of the devil, she added, as she spotted Jeffrey strolling across the meadow from the parking lot. Her stomach did flip-flops when she saw him. He was so cute, especially in the faded madras pants he was wearing. She loved the way his hair glinted in the sunlight. Suddenly she felt herself melt. She wanted nothing more than to run to him, throw her arms around him, and apologize for the night before. But the next instant, she caught Jessica's eye. Jessica was standing on the makeshift pitcher's mound, waving the frisbee toward her sister. Jeffrey was between them now, walking toward Elizabeth and Enid. When Jessica gave her sister a victory sign with her fingers, Elizabeth felt her resolve returning. Jessica was right. It was terribly important to make Jeffrey understand that he couldn't treat her the way he had the day before. She had promised to play it cool, and she was going to even if it seemed to go against her intuition. Eliz, can I talk to you? Jeffrey said, coming directly to the spot where Enid and Elizabeth were sitting. Sure, Elizabeth said, making it sound as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. We'll be back in a second, she told Enid, who was looking on with an amused expression on her face. I felt terrible about last night, Jeffrey said, in a low voice as they walked toward the lake. Oh, last night. Elizabeth said in an artificial voice. Her heart went out to him, and she wanted to give up the game playing right away, but she had promised Jessica she'd try. I was just really hurt that you hadn't told me about this dinner thing before. I guess it's kind of hard for me. I mean, I've never had a serious girlfriend before, and you and Todd... That's true, Elizabeth said, taking a deep breath. Todd and I have really shared an awful lot. Jeffrey looked miserable. I bet you two still care for each other, too, he muttered, kicking a pebble into the water. Well, Elizabeth said, trying for the right mixture of remote tenderness. I guess we do, really. I mean, after you've been through everything Todd and I have, well, you're bound to still feel something. I wouldn't be human if I didn't, right? Yeah, Jeffrey said shortly. Yeah, I guess so. Let's just forget all about it for now, Elizabeth said. She smiled at him. We can talk about it some other time, can't we? It's a gorgeous day. Jeffrey looked distraught. I've got this awful feeling that you're hiding something from me, Liz. You're not acting like yourself. Remember, Elizabeth told herself, mysterious and remote. If she was going to keep Jeffrey feeling jealous, she couldn't be too reassuring. I'm not hiding anything, she declared, averting her eyes just enough to make herself look a little guilty. Liz, I want to know right now how you feel about Todd, Jeffrey said loudly. I can't stand this. Are you still in love with him or what? Of course I'm not still in love with him, Elizabeth said reprovingly, but I can care for him anyway, can't I? I don't like the idea of sharing you, that's all, he retorted, and I don't like the way you're talking about all of this either. 
I don't think you're being straight with me, and it isn't like you. I'm being completely honest about everything, Elizabeth told him hastily. Come on, Jeffrey, she added, trying hard for a Jessica-like pout. Let's stop arguing and just relax and have a good time. Why don't we go up and play frisbee with everyone? I don't feel like playing frisbee, Jeffrey snapped, pulling away from her. I'm going to go get a sandwich, he added, storming up the bank toward Enid. Elizabeth stood there, feeling terrible. Something told her that this wasn't the way things were supposed to have gone. Either she wasn't very good at making guys jealous, or Jessica's plan wasn't the best. She didn't seem to have done much to straighten things out. Great, she muttered to herself, climbing up the bank to join Enid. The truth was that she had made a little mess into a bigger mess, and she couldn't help feeling that it was partly Jessica's fault again. Chapter 10 It was Tuesday morning, and Elizabeth and Enid were standing and talking at Enid's locker before school began. You mean he hasn't called you since Sunday? Enid demanded incredulously. That doesn't seem like Jeffrey. Well, we bumped into each other this morning, and he asked me if I'd meet him in the cafeteria at noon, Elizabeth said unhappily. He didn't look like himself. In fact, he seemed really on edge. I just hope I haven't completely messed everything up. I don't think Jessica's advice worked in our case. Jeffrey just doesn't seem like the kind of guy who enjoys being jealous. Enid's green eyes were empathetic. Of course not. No offense to your sister, but I think this game playing nonsense is for the birds. Jeffrey's above that sort of thing, and I'm sure he thinks you are too. He probably figures if you're trying to make him jealous, you've got a pretty good reason for it. She looked closely at her friend. You don't still feel anything for Todd, do you? Elizabeth laughed. No, I don't, she told Enid. I may be confused, but I'm not that confused. I just don't think it's fair for Jeffrey to demand that I give up my friendship with Todd. What do you think? Enid looked serious. I think you have to be very sensitive. I mean, you're absolutely right as far as the principle of the thing is concerned. In theory, Jeffrey is being overpossessive. But look at it from his point of view. He really needs a lot of reassurance from you, Liz. I just hope... What? Elizabeth demanded as her friend's voice trailed off. I just hope it all works out, Enid said. She gave Elizabeth a warm smile. I'm sure it will, too. You two have so much going for you. You're not going to let a dumb argument wreck everything now. Just then, the bell rang. Elizabeth and Enid had to go in separate directions. I'll let you know what happens, Elizabeth said dejectedly as she walked away. I've been feeling absolutely rotten since Sunday afternoon, Jeffrey began, his eyes fixing seriously on Elizabeth. They were sitting opposite each other at one of the tables on the patio outside the cafeteria. Elizabeth swallowed. I felt horrible too, she admitted in a low voice. Liz, we've got to straighten this out, Jeffrey added in an anguished voice. I feel like I'm losing you. Elizabeth stared at him, her lips trembling slightly. I feel terrible about the way I acted on Sunday afternoon. The last thing I meant was to make you think I'm still the slightest bit interested in Todd. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's you I care about, Jeffrey. You should know that by now. Jeffrey reached across the table to clasp her hands tightly in his. That makes me so happy, he said sincerely. So does this mean you'll come with me to the opening party on Friday night? Elizabeth blinked. This wasn't what she expected him to say at all. I don't know, she said uncomfortably. I haven't spoken to Todd yet, but I'll probably talk to him either tonight or tomorrow night. She looked away, not really sure what to say to him. Is it really such a big deal? She asked at last. I mean, this awards banquet is for such a good cause, and it would mean a lot to Todd for me to go with him. What about what it means to me to have you with me on Friday night? Elizabeth pulled her hands from his. She was starting to get angry. Jeffrey, you're not being fair, she exclaimed. Todd's only going to be here for a few days. It would be different if you had some reason to suspect I still felt something for him. But I promise you, I don't. He's just a good friend. Well, then that means I should get priority on Friday night, Jeffrey objected. You and I have been planning on going to the carnival together for weeks, Liz. This awards banquet thing seems to have just come up out of the blue. It didn't just come up out of the blue, Elizabeth said hotly, her eyes filling with tears. Jeffrey, come on. It's not like missing the party on Friday night is going to ruin our whole weekend. 
I'll drive up Saturday morning and we'll still have the rest of the weekend together. Great, Jeffrey said moodily, slumping in his chair. And I suppose Todd will just happen to not have a date for the snowball, so he'll have to spend the whole night dancing with you. Elizabeth's face was flushed with anger. You're being impossible, she snapped. For goodness sakes, Jeffrey, you're acting like a three-year-old. Can't you stop being selfish and jealous for just a second and realize that going to the awards banquet is completely reasonable? It isn't reasonable, Jeffrey said furiously. You're my girlfriend, right? Not Todd's. You and I have plans for Friday night, and now you're trying to break them. That isn't reasonable. Elizabeth jumped up from the table, so furious she was shaking. If you're going to act like this, I'm glad I'm going to the awards banquet with Todd instead of that stupid party with you. I'm glad too, Jeffrey said loudly, as angry as she was. Why don't you just spend the whole weekend with Todd if you feel that way about him? Maybe I will, Elizabeth sputtered, tears running down her cheeks. He's a lot better company than you are. I can tell you that much. As soon as those words were out of her mouth, she regretted them, but she was far too angry to apologize. Spinning on her heel, she ran from the patio, but she couldn't put the impression of Jeffrey's anguished face out of her mind. She knew her parting retort had stung him terribly. It was one of the worst afternoons she could remember, and all she could do was suffer through one class after another, praying for it to end so she could escape and be by herself. It seemed that the final bell signaling that day was over would never come. But at last it did, and Elizabeth made her way through the crowded halls to her locker. She felt numb, as if her feelings had been erased and all she could do was let herself be propelled by the crowd around her. Before she reached her locker, she was accosted by Amy Sutton and Jessica, who were besides themselves with excitement. Liz, wish us luck. We're off to the station, Jessica sang out, dancing happily around her sister. She was oblivious of Elizabeth's stony expression. Good luck, Elizabeth muttered. Do we look all right? Amy asked smoothing down the front of the black sweater and houndstooth skirt she was wearing and twirling around for Elizabeth's inspection. You look fine, Elizabeth said, reaching her locker and noting with some surprise that a piece of notebook paper had been folded and stuck in one of the metal slots just at eye level. Maybe it was a note from Jeffrey. If we win today, this could be the beginning of really big things, Jessica was exclaiming excitedly. She and Amy were in such high spirits, it was hard to imagine their being able to sit still for the duration of the contest. But Elizabeth wasn't paying attention to them. Fingers trembling, she unfolded the note. Sure enough, it was from Jeffrey. I'm driving out to Las Palmas Canyon this afternoon to think things through. I'll be there until six. If you want to talk, meet me at the intersection of Route 27 and Canyon Drive. If you don't come, I'll assume the worst. That was the whole note. It was signed Jeffrey, not love, just Jeffrey. Elizabeth scanned the note several times before turning urgently to her sister. What time are you going to be back with the car? The show only lasts half an hour. It starts at 3.30, so I should be home by 4.30 at the latest. Why? Is anything wrong? Elizabeth thought quickly. If Jessica had the car back by 4.30, she could make it to the canyon by 5 o'clock. You promised you'll have it back by 4.30? It's an emergency, she said quietly. I really need you to promise, Jess. I promise, Jessica said soberly, her eyes wide. Jess, come on, we're going to be late, Amy whined. Sighing, Elizabeth turned to her locker. She hoped Jessica kept her word this time, because from the sound of Jeffrey's note, if she didn't make it out to the canyon, it was going to be the end of everything between them. She was still angry about everything that had happened, but she didn't want to lose him. She had to do her best to get out to Las Palmas Canyon by six o'clock. The excitement was mounting in the television studio. On one side of the days, Jake Thomas and David Campbell were sitting, their faces tense as the questions came thicker and faster. Jessica and Amy were sitting on the other side of the days, while Mike Malloy, the host of Trivia Bowl, fired questions. For the first half of the show, Jake and David had been in the lead, but in the second half, Amy and Jessica had caught up. Now it was the last question, and the score was tied. 
Okay, folks, this is it, Mike Malloy boomed. The question that determines which team has a chance to appear on the live version of Trivia Bowl that will be aired next month. Are you ready? We're ready, David said tensely, avoiding Jessica's imploring gaze. Okay, folks, take a deep breath, think very, very hard, and here's the question. Remember, ladies, it goes to Jake and David first, and the question is, how many fluid cu cups are there in a gallon? I repeat, how many fluid cups in a gallon? Oh, no, Jessica groaned. She couldn't believe how easy the question was. After they'd been stumped for the last 25 minutes on really tough questions, they knew they had lost now. I've got it, David announced, snapping his fingers. 24, he said, triumphantly, sitting back in his chair and grinning. 24 cups is absolutely wrong, Mike Malloy said. Okay, folks, that means the question goes to the other team. It's a tiebreaker. Can either of you girls tell me how many fluid cups there are in one gallon? Sixteen, Jessica and Amy shrieked in unison. Sixteen is right. Jessica and Amy, you're our first winners, Mike yelled above their excited laughter. For the next few moments, pandemonium broke out in the studio. Amy and Jessica were so excited they were practically hysterical. Jessica even hugged David in her excitement, and he hugged her back. Nice work, he said, kissing her on the cheek. This calls for a celebration, Mike said. What do you say we go for pizza at the Pizza Palace? That sounds wonderful, Jessica exclaimed. I'll drive, she assured Amy, squeezing her arm with a smile on her face. It was 4.35, but Jessica didn't notice the clock. As usual, she wasn't wearing a watch, and she had lost track of the time. She had also completely forgotten her promise, too.